we will pass seamlessly on to Sean Reese, who is a theatre maker and PhD student mm -hmm. at Compton. That's right. Good afternoon, I'm Sean. Um, today I'm going to be talking about not theatre and austerity, but ways in which we can use theatrical forms of resistance against austerity. So I'm specifically looking at the ways in which government agencies and the media persuade and sell the idea and concept of austerity the to the public, and wondering if there's a way in which we can use the same tools to subvert this and reattack the policy itself. So let me start by quoting David Cameron in his address to big business in 2012. This country is in the economic equivalent of war today, and we need the same spirit. We need to forget about crossing every T and dotting every I, and we need to throw everything we've got at winning in this global race. Fighting talk indeed from Cameron here, who compares the war effort and spirit in the 1940s to the government's approach to austerity discourse today. He says, you need us to be tough, you need us to be radical. From this small excerpt, we begin to see that austerity is far more than an economic policy. As Cameron utilizes historical comparisons, drumming up nostalgic and romanticized images of a collective war effort and emboldened community spirit. Rather than economic policy, austerity is a complex ideological concept. The politics of austerity are a site of conflict, and significantly the weapons of choice in declaring this ideological war a cultural. Britain is expecting a further 12 billion in cuts, and yet we are quite to see where these cuts will fall. The austerity drive has dramatically impacted the political landscape, irrevocably affecting the status, stability, and future of the welfare state. Yet it is my belief that there is untapped currency in subverting this cultural weaponry that the media and political agencies have successfully used to reinforce austerity myths that is tradition, cultural events, and historical fetishization. Firstly, though, to austerity, the myth, the truth, and the art of spin. Prominent economists claim that austerity is dangerous. It doesn't reduce public debt. It is unsustainable, putting huge wealth into the hands of the few. It is bad for public health, leading to huge increases in mental health issues and suicide rates and it even weakens the position of the government. Thomas Piketty observes, the rich world is rich, the governments of the rich world are poor. This is a strange paradox indeed. As the government is redistribut redistributing funds from wider society to the few, keeping public debt at unprecedented levels, but the government is also dependent upon the borrowing cycle itself. Private companies now have greater wealth than entire countries. Apple this year reported profits um, which are actually higher than the GDP of Finland, Hong Kong, and Chile. Ultimately, then, austerity measures are contributing to private wealth, substantially increasing without even addressing the public debt issue. Significant battles have been won by implementing austerity through culturally reproducing and repeating a series of austerity-related myths. Widely shared narratives have been disseminated, which are, in fact, untrue. Firstly, we are not, as George Osborne famously declared, all in it together. That much is clear by Osborne's plans to re reduce tax working credits, freezing public sector salaries, which in real terms amounts to a £50 reduction a week since 2008, while personally receiving an annual 11% pay increase for MPs. Very nice. The second myth is that trickle-down economic theory works. Prominent think tank, OECD, state that focusing exclusively on growth and austerity and assuming that its benefits will automatically trickle down to different segments of the population may undermine growth in the long run, inasmuch as inequality actually increases. However, trickle-down economics have purchase among governments and corporations. However, if it is a heavily criticized theory and lacking in recent data to prove its current suitability, then this begs the question, why is our entire economic policy based on it? The third myth refers to the culprits of this recession. Quiggin states that the politics of debt have transformed into a morality play, shifting blame from financial institutions to the irresponsible spending of the state. Dominant narratives in the media frequently reproduce this sentiment, dividing society into the deserving and the undeserving underscoring justifications for widespread cuts to welfare agencies, 
specifically focused upon the unemployed, single parents and immigrants, to name a few. Terminologies such as benefit scrounger have become increasingly popular. The Sun, for instance, launched a Beat the Cheat campaign, encouraging readers to be patriotic by reporting suspected cheats to the Benefit Fraud hotline. Controversial television program Benefit Street reinforced these views and was criticized for inaccuracy in demonizing welfare claimants. In 2014, Benefit Street was even referenced in the House of Commons. Ian Duncan Smith argued that it justified, it justified government changes to the Welfare Reform Act. Clearly ideologically driven, the focus on benefit fraud paints a distorted picture. Benef benefit fraud amounts to 2% of the estimated fraud in the UK, whereas tax fraud, 69%, or £14 billion. Pounds. The public misconception regarding benefit fraud is 34 times higher than the actual figures state. So, how were the public so misinformed? Here we turn to the success of cultural weaponry. Austerity discourse frequently draws upon the past for its usefulness. De Groot discusses the fetishization of history, taking advantage of the fact that the historical in popular culture and con contemporary society is multiple, multiplying, and unstable. One stark example, if you can recall to the Christmas advert last year that made big news, was the Sainsbury's advert, Christmas is for sharing. This drew upon the cultural capital of the famous temporary Christmas truce of 1914. Such scenes were expertly recreated, but it included an exchange between a British and German soldier of a bar of chocolate on sale at Sainsbury's. Seen by many as a moving tribute, this case demonstrates clearly the way historical events can merge fact and fiction for political or commercial purposes. How, though, can we debunk these myths and reclaim austerity politics? As Jeremy Gilbert suggests, when describing the politics of disclosure, information is not enough to motivate political action. What is crucial instead is the question of persuasion. In much the same way as Sainsbury's and David Cameron exploited the past for selling products and ideas, I intend to, to utilize history, culture, and folklore in creating performances of dissent against austerity. Here I turn to the folkloric custom of rough music, Rough music predates the Middle Ages and stands as a strong example of early radical performance, bringing together elements of theatrical protest and collective direct action, ritual and celebration, modes championed by creative activists today. It can be summarized as a folkloric form where community members use dramatic forms, a, a type of processional street theater, and a cacophony of sound to express their rejection and hostility towards individuals offending community norms. And in these images, you can see people on a chair and with um, pots and pans, and then leading to the doorstep of the, of the culprit themselves. Noise-fueled action and ritualized hostility might have included the parading of the victim on a donkey, masking and dancing, street drama, or the burning of effigies. We can already hear see stark parallels between this practice and contemporary activism. The Iraq anti-war demonstration, for instance, teemed with elements of rough music. The cacophony of sound, the banging of pots and pans with wooden spoons, and Tony Blair, the culprit or victim, represented through effigies and masks. In my own theatre practice, it is my intention to experiment with rough music as a model for creative forms of resistance against austerity. In my first experiments regarding merging rough music and protest, I built upon the notion of using cultural familiar language and gestures in ritual folklore and theater in the form of a maypole dance. Taking part on May Day, uh, this piece was staged so as to utilize the historical associations which people may have with May Day workers' rights, and of course, the folkloric traditions themselves of the maypole dance. Existing as part of the Brighton's People Assembly Against Austerity, this piece ga began with a cacophony of noise made by the banging of pots and pans. We then marched a masked George Osborne to the foot of the maypole. George Osborne then took out a Financial Times newspaper emblazoned with the infamous phrase, we are all in this together. In response, activists read out testimonials from local people explaining how the austerity measures affected them. For instance, I'm just going to read one out. Dear George, 
My name is Bradley, and I live in Brighton with my girlfriend and three children. My days are filled with hunger and thoughts of budgeting. Since I became a father 10 years ago, I have never been out of work, but my girlfriend and I have to go without food regularly. Like many people in this country, hunger is now part of our ordinary routine. I have begun counting calories, not to lose weight, but to try and make sure I get enough. It is difficult to describe our lives now without sensationalizing. The best way to put it is like this. Poverty becomes a physical and psychological state rather than just an economic condition. Am I a victim or a parasite? How can I work more? We then branded George Osborne an austerity liar and garbed him with a golden sash, which you can see a bit there, which we then followed with a maypole dance, tying the ribbons around George Osborne and the pole. The version of the work intended to echo elements of rough music and the parading of the culprit of George Osborne, masking and dancing, the banging of pots and pans and street drama. Experiment experimenting with rough music was instructive in demonstrating the victories and pitfalls in reimagining rough music as contemporary protest. For future versions, I intend to move away from verbal expression, which is lost to outside elements often, in exploring instead the role of participation in the form of play and gaming, which was at the forefront of rough music in the past. Far from being a spectator sport, rough music demanded full participation. Community members often wore elaborate, complex roles in full costume. An account of rough music in the Devon Stag Hunt, for instance, describes a man wrapped in sacking, horns on his head, who ran through the town making whinnying noises, pursued by the hunt, to end the chase on the doorstep of the person to be punished. The hounds were dressed up too and made a barking noise, a red-coated huntsman urging them on with a cracking whip. Equally important, though, is the journey to an arrival at a politicized site. For despite intrusions upon the right to protest in the UK, and as we all know, there are many and they keep coming at us, collective journeying impresses notions of agency and shared histories upon its participants. Kathleen Stewart argues, being in a specific place alters the biochemistry and neurology of the subject. The atmosphere or the environment literally gets into the individual. In tracing and retracing the steps which political actors have previously trodden, activists recall the past and reaffirm their presence in a deeply politicized site associated with resistance. As Rebecca Schneider argues, an action repeated again and again and again, however fractured, has a kind of staying power, persists through time, and even, in a sense, serves as a fleshy kind of document of its own reoccurrence. As such, I aim in rough music future incarnations, rather than to stage performances, to work instead with a kind of gaming structure which involves role-playing, participation, the collective journeying of, to the politicized site. My hope is that the playful format will offer participation, participants empowerment and freedom while also creating theatrical and extraordinary moments in the streets themselves, so that seeing it and coming across it is also a form of protest that people can recognize from the street. For the next series of experiments, my practice will involve a treasure hunt featuring both prime financial district sites and sites of historical civil disobedience, spotting and chasing masked George Osborne's through the streets, ending with a cacophony of noise and collective and choreographed gesture of dissent yet to be decided. Through my practice so far, though, it has become clear that if my aim is to make anti-establishment practice, which dismantles, subverts, and theatricalizes the politics of austerity, it is not enough to debunk myths. It is not enough to debunk myths through the dis dissemination of expert opinions or reproducing alternative narratives rarely heard in the mainstream media. But instead, we must debunk them in a way that persuades and reclaims the politics of austerity. The question of how to achieve this is still very much in the making. I also have no magic bullet. In David Cameron's words, you need us to be tough you need us to be radical, so we will. My advice during this urgent time is do not keep calm. Thank you.